Whenever the Watchtower changes doctrine or some kind of theological teaching, the governing body claims they received this from Jehovah. Therefore, the old teaching or former doctrine is no longer valid, a new teaching or new doctrine is called new light. The old light is obsolete even if it contradicts the new light. In the 2023 annual meeting of the Watchtower, Jeffrey Winder gives a talk entitled How Does the Light Get Brighter and makes these comments. At what rate does he reveal new light? Is it all at once like a dump truck or is it metered out like a trickle? Well, the answer to that is found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, in verse 18. Proverbs 4, 18. But the path of the righteous is like the bright morning light that grows brighter and brighter until full daylight. So the Bible here uses the illustration of daylight. And what does that teach us? Well, the Watchtower said, these words aptly apply to the way in which Jehovah reveals his purpose to his people gradually. So just as daylight grows brighter and brighter gradually, a proper understanding of Bible truths comes gradually as we, as we need it and as we are able to absorb it and use it. And we appreciate that, don't we? It's easier on our eyes when literal light gets brighter gradually. And so it is with the understanding of Jehovah's purpose as well. Uh, for example, think about Abraham. Could Abraham have handled and absorbed a complete understanding of Jehovah's will at his time? how he would use the 12 tribes of Israel, the Mosaic law, uh, the understanding of Christ and the payment of the ransom, and the first century Christian congregation, the heavenly hope, the last days, details about the great tribulation. No way, he couldn't handle all of that. He didn't need it. But Abraham had what he needed to serve Jehovah acceptably during the time that he lived. Well, we have the privilege to live during the last days, where true knowledge was foretold to become abundant. But even still, it is released and made known at a pace that we can absorb, that we can handle, and that we can use. And we thank Jehovah for that. So this is what we know from the scriptures and from our own experience as well uh, about how the light gets brighter in modern times. It comes about by means of the Holy Spirit through his channel of the faithful and discreet slave he reveals it gradually and at a time that it is needed. Well, knowing this, then we are not embarrassed about adjustments that are made, uh, nor do is an apology needed for not getting it exactly right previously. We understand this is how Jehovah operates. He reveals matters gradually when it is needed. We are not embarrassed, nor is an apology needed for not getting it right exactly right previously. What a shameful and impenitent statement to make. The reason for this is Jehovah's Witnesses claim to be the only group to teach truth as revealed to their governing body by Jehovah. If this is the case, why has Watchtower Doctrine experienced ongoing changes? They routinely use one scripture to justify the new light doctrine. The scripture in Proverbs 14 verse 18 is routinely used to justify this. The Watchtower interprets the word light in Proverbs 4 as referring to Watchtower doctrinal understanding. Yet, this is simply done as justification for prior error. But this scripture has absolutely no bearing on this when read within context. For thousands of years, people have understood Proverbs uh, chapter 4 to be discussing behavior, as is easily identifiable when reading the entire chapter in context. The verses surrounding 18 state the following. The wicked do not sleep unless they do badness. The way of the wicked ones is like the gloom. They have not known at what they keep stumbling. Listen to the discipline of a father. Keep my commandments. Safeguard your heart. Christian writers and biblical scholars explain what is clear from Proverbs is that the reader can choose to either seek wisdom or live a life of folly. Proverbs 4 verse 18 was not intended to be 
a prophetic indication that God gradually reveals truth to the Watchtower Society. Rather than an extract sentence when taken in its entirety, the context of Proverbs chapter 4 is a comparison of behavior between good and bad people, not the dispensing of doctrinal truth through an organization. From the outset, it can be seen that using this scripture to discuss doctrinal errors and changes is without basis. Proverbs 4 identifies that righteous people fare better than wicked and not prophetic of the Watchtower Society. However, let us entertain the idea that within this passage there is the prophetic foreshadowing that God progressively reveals truth to his people during the time of the end. This concept cannot apply to Watchtower history as Watchtower doctrine has not been refined but changed. Consider whether the following change is really a matter of doctrinal light getting brighter. Imagine being a witness parent of a child who needed a kidney transplant in 1970. Although the awake, 1949, December 22, had described transplants as wonders of modern surgery, in 1967, God revealed that transplants were wrong in his eyes. The Watchtower, 1967, November 15, stated that being now enlightened by God's word, God's people understood that transplants are against divine principles and cannibalistic. The parents must sincerely have believed they were putting Job first when watching their child die, refusing uh, them the opportunity of possible survival through a transplant. Now, how would that parent feel on reading the Watchtower of 1980, March the 15th, where it says there is no biblical command pointedly forbidding the taking in of other human tissue. It is a matter of personal decision. The Enlightenment of 1967 had proved to be dark, harmful, and in need of later correction, a regressive doctrine that resulted in the unnecessary death of members. When a doctrine changes and then reverts back to the original position, this is not evidence of light getting brighter. It is evidence of a lack of so-called Holy Spirit and divine direction of the governing body. The concept of light becoming brighter implies that previous doctrine was correct, but incomplete. Russell eloquently wrote the following truism that if we were following a man, undoubtedly it would be different with us. Undoubtedly one human idea would contradict another and that that which was light one or two or six years ago would be regarded as darkness now. But with God there is no variableness, neither shadow uh, of turning, and so it is with truth. Any knowledge of light coming from God must be like its author. A new view of truth never can contradict the former truth. New light never extinguishes older light, but adds to it. The point here is clear. Teachings may be refined, but not contradict previous teachings. This has not been the case with Watchtower doctrine. Many Watchtower teachings were later discarded as incorrect. Others have changed back and forth numerous times, some reverting to their original position, others contradicting a former truth. It has regularly been the case that Washtar doctrine was not illuminated, illuminated, but eclipsed. It was not increasing light that dictated in the 1950s that Jesus no longer was to be worshipped. It was a fundamental teaching that was, or currently is, wrong. The failed date prophecies, um, the pyramids were prophetic of 1914. Superior authorities were governments, then it was God, and then governments again. And of course the numerous changes to the meaning of the generation. These were not clarifications, these were wrong teachings. How many wrong teachings did God allow to become part of the Bible, uh, of the Bible canon? Now compare that with how many wrong teachings are contained within the Watchtower over less than 150 years. Ongoing reversal of doctrine can only indicate a God is not involved in these new flashes of light that later turn out to be falsehoods. Yet the Watchtower leadership claim these changes are from Jehovah, not to be questioned. But what Jeffrey Winder says next gives us more insight as to how adjustments are made within the governing body. But now back to our original question. Okay, we understand these things from the scriptures, but really, how does it work? When the brothers are meeting together, how does Jehovah help them 
come to a better understanding of things? Well, that's an appropriate question because Jehovah does not intend for it to be uh, a mystery or overly secretive. So generally, the process happens this way. First of all, a question comes up. And so it could be that a governing body member in his personal study or his personal Bible reading notices something that then raises a question. Or it could be that a question comes up during the preparation or translation of spiritual food that requires more consideration. A world events might put the spotlight on a particular prophecy that then gets closer attention. So in one way or another, a question comes up. And that question is then put on the governing body's agenda for discussion. And the question is, does this require or, or um, warrant additional research? The brothers are not making a final decision on what the new understanding will be, just asking, does it uh, warrant additional research? And if the answer is yes, then a research team is assigned to provide recommendations and research for the governing body to consider. And this research includes a summary of everything that we have said, the organization has said on the subject since 1879, all the watchtowers, what have we said? Also, it includes what the context of the verse indicates about its meaning. meaning. Further, what, uh, what bearing do parallel accounts have on the understanding of the account, if there are any parallel accounts? And finally, what impact does the original Hebrew or Greek have on our understanding of the verse. Well, once that whole research package is, is compiled, it's placed back on the governing body's agenda for review. And of course, once it goes on the agenda, then each individual member of the governing body under prayer reviews the information and thinks about it in preparation for the meeting. And then it's discussed as a group at the governing body meeting, again, under prayer, uh, relying on Jehovah's Holy Spirit. And when this matter is discussed, the discussion is not rushed, nor is the decision forced. Uh, but often, like in the first century, it's a lively discussion as the brothers feel free to share their opinions and their thoughts, the results of their meditation and their research. But there's also humility there. Because again, none of the brothers are trying to force their idea or try to get their thoughts approved. But there is this collective, unified uh, desire to see Jehovah's direction on the matter and where is he where is he steering things the goal is to discern Jehovah's direction on the matter and often or at times we could say the final result might be quite different than what the research package originally recommended but that's Jehovah's spirit working through the faithful and discreet slave to bring us to the right decision and the brothers are looking for a unanimous decision at times, it may seem like this is a solid adjustment, but if it's not unanimous, it just might not be time yet for it to be revealed. So it's not forced. The matter is set aside. And it could be that sometime later, even some years later, the matter comes back up and then it sails right through. Uh, or maybe it does get approved, but now with a couple of key points discerned that weren't discerned earlier. Well, with this thorough process under prayer, and when there is unanimous accord, then the brothers take that as Jehovah's direction and then are happy to share it with the brotherhood. Raymond Franz, a former member of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, provided a very revealing insight into how decisions are made at the highest level of the organization in his book, Crisis of Conscience. Franz's account sheds light on the inner workings of the governing body, offering a detailed overview of the decision-making process within this influential body. According to France, the governing body operates under a strict um, hierarchical uh, structure with ultimate authority vested in a sworn group of individuals. The members of the governing body are considered to be the faithful and discreet slave mentioned in Matthew 24, verse 40, 45, which was entrusted with interpreting scripture and providing spiritual guidance to the worldwide community of Jehovah's Witnesses. Decisions at the governing body level are reached through a process of consensus building and deliberation. Meetings are held regularly during which members discuss doctrinal matters, uh, organizational policies, and strategic initiatives. While individual members may express differing opinions and perspectives, 
The ultimate goal is to reach unity of thought and action. Francis' account highlights the influence of uh, organizational policies and doctrinal uh, interpretations on the decision-making process. He describes how certain teachings and practices are regarded as non-negotiable, uh, with dissent or questioning of official doctrine strongly discouraged. Members are expected to adhere unquestioningly to the decisions of the governing body, regardless of uh, personal reservations or objections. Critically, Franz also exposes the limitations of transparency and accountability within the governing body. He suggests that decision-making is often driven by considerations of organizational expediency and self-preservation, rather than genuine concern for the spiritual welfare of Jehovah's Witnesses. Dissenting voices are marginalized and dissenters risk facing ostracism or expulsion from the organization. Overall, Franz's portrayal of decision-making at the governing body level offers a sobering critique of the authoritarian tendencies and lack of accountability within the leadership structure of Jehovah's Witnesses. His insights underscore the importance of transparency, openness, and humility in the exercise of religious authority, and raise important questions about the ethical and moral responsibilities of those in positions of power and influence. Raymond Franz does mention in his book of Crisis of Conscience that a two-thirds majority is required to accept matters of doctrinal changes within the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. This requirement reflects the significant level of consensus needed among the members before any doctrinal altercations can be officially adopted. However, what we now hear is that a unanimous decision is needed for any changes to take effect. Requiring unanimous agreement can lead to gridlock and indecision even if a single board member refuses to support the proposed change. This can result in delays in implementing necessary reforms and hinder the organization's ability to adapt or changing to changing circumstances. For example, if all but one member of the governing body votes to abolish the no blood policy, the changes shall. This can have a devastating effect on the rank and file and needless deaths will continue. Watchtower changes include numerous false dates, significant doctrine, uh, and the promotion of pagan symbols and teachings. Rules on shunning, medical advice, and education have been adversely life-changing, even life-threatening. Doctrinal meandering cannot be justified as new light. Rather, it is proof that the governing body is not divinely directed, but operates just like any other commercial enterprise. They are a billion-dollar corporation, masquerading as a religion.